The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, and thank you for joining today's webinar, Cyber Crimes and Fraud Attempts During COVID-19. Before we begin, I would like to take a minute to go over a couple ground rules for today's webinar. All phones have been placed on mute for this webinar. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please submit your questions in the questions tab and we will answer them as time permits. At this point, I'd like to go over today's presenters. As a partner in Bloom Shapiro's Risk Advisory Group, Heather Beerfield has over 15 years of experience managing risk and building information security management programs. In her role, Heather helps clients in a variety of areas, including IT risk management, information security governance, corporate IT audits, and corporate operational risk functions. Heather brings a wealth of experience in multiple aspects of risk management across business operations, including regulatory compliance, corporate accounting, corporate information systems, general ledger operations, fund accounting, and more. As a partner and leader of Bloom's litigation and valuation practice, Frank Rudwitz has more than 30 years of experience conducting domestic and international investigations for fraud, forensic accounting, asset tracing, and other litigation-related matters. He has appeared on NBC Dateline in Forensic Files for his investigative work and has been appointed a compliance and ethics monitor for a number of organizations within the construction, government, and environmental industries. Frank has experienced an expert witness testimony and has testified in matters involving forensic accounting, trade secrets, independent investigations, and security. As a partner in our advisory services group, David Sun's expertise includes cybersecurity response, responding to data breaches and privacy incidents, including ransomware attacks, internal employee malfeasance, and government agency investigations for both public and private sector clients. With over 20 years of experience, David has delivered expert services to clients involving data and system security, cyber forensic response, and post-breach remediation. He is a practical problem solver and technologist who can describe technology-related issues in, in understandable terms to attorneys, judges, and juries. David has served as an expert on numerous high-profile matters and has testified in various courts. And finally, Jeff Ziplow is a partner in the firm's Risk Advisory Services Group. He has significant experience working with organizations to assess their internal IT controls as they relate to business operations and helps to develop recommendations to mitigate risk. In his role, Jeff works with clients on data breach responses, cybersecurity risk assessments, and provides insight and guidance on developing better security practices. In addition, Jeff works on process and control related projects to enhance operational efficiency and provide tangible control recommendations. I'd now like to hand it over to Jeff Zippo to begin today's presentation. Thank you, Jared. Good morning, everyone, uh, on this bright, um, sunny uh, Monday morning. Um, at Bloom, we thought it was uh, very important to, to reach out to our clients and even prospective clients to share with them uh, what's going on uh, as it relates to, you know, the cyber front uh, and fraud front, if you will, uh, related to the COVID-19 situation that we're all faced with. So our agenda today is really to cover a, a broad range of areas and certainly um, talking about how to be proactive with um, cybersecurity. Um, we certainly want to talk about some of best practices, um, highlight some of the um, specific fraud threats um, regarding COVID-19 and cyber threats, uh, looking at some of the fraud attempts that we're seeing and certainly get into details about that, but also answer your questions. Um, we, prior to the session, we identified and, and certainly asked for people to share with us or identify for us any questions that they have. We have those and we'll certainly go through that. But if you do have any questions, feel free to um, reach out during this uh, webinar and, and ask questions, and we'll do our best to, to get into those questions uh, later on in the agenda. So with that, let me turn it over to uh, David Sun so he can talk a little bit more about being proactive with cybersecurity. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so, you know, during, during these uncertain times, there were uh, businesses are being forced to make uh, significant changes in, in how they operate. Uh, most importantly, or significantly, companies are, are being asked to uh, uh, 
make decisions in, in real time. Uh, and these are you know, on, on things that they didn't anticipate. Uh, things like, uh, you know, can the business operate uh, if employees work from home? Uh, can remote employees access uh, data uh, to the systems they need so they can do their job and, and hopefully allow the company to continue to operate? Uh, what devices will people use if they need to uh, work from home? Are they, are they taking their uh, uh, work equipment home? Are they uh, going to work, do their work from their personal computers at home? Uh, you know, those are the kinds of questions that, lot, that right off the bat, uh, many, many companies were being forced to think about and work through, uh, and the IT departments had to uh, uh, try to come up with answers to those questions. Um, and then once you get past those questions, uh, be, 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 once you get past the, is it possible to do it? Uh, and, and you start to do it, or, or maybe start to do it, uh, then you start getting faced with the more complicated questions, the ones that are, that are, that are uh, not necessarily the IT department's uh, uh, role to solve. Um, things like, if I have employees working from home, does that violate uh, protective agreements, privacy agreements, confidentiality agreements I may have in place with my clients, my, uh, my partners, my supply chain? Um, you know, uh, how will the IT department resolve problems uh, and, 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 and handle IT support requests for employees when they're, from, when they're working from home uh, and when the IT people are working from home? So everybody's at home. Uh, do you ha do, do, does everybody have the ability to support each other uh, from that home environment? Uh, and then how would you even deal with, IT, with a cybersecurity incident uh, if everybody's remote? Uh, Companies may have an incident response plan, but does it factor in when everybody is remote and, and nobody's on site? Um, you know, those are the even more complicated questions that uh, people get uh, people get presented in this in this time of uh, of change here. Uh, and and the reason these things are a problem is because you know while while everybody is uh, working from home, so are the hackers. <laughs> uh, you know, the hackers are, are doing what they're doing still, and nothing's changed for them. So during this pandemic, you know, the, the cyber threat landscape it really hasn't changed, hasn't diminished, and in some cases has, has gotten worse. Uh, and and, and uh, we're seeing things like uh, 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 additional attacks, some of them uh, leveraging people's anxiety around COVID-19 to, to uh, accelerate or, or, or uh, uh, make that attack worse. Uh, more effective, and, and what's happening is is that during uh, decisions that people are making during uh, this this crisis can have long lasting implications to the company uh, during and after uh, after the crisis. Uh, again, you know the threat actors they're remaining active. They're 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 continuing to do what they do. They're capitalizing on this. Uh, you know, as a reminder, you know things you may have, people that may have seen ninety four percent of of, ma of uh, malware is delivered via email, phishing attacks that are on the rise, uh, and, and, and if, if people are working from home and they get access to their email, that means phishing attacks can continue. Uh, so that hasn't changed. Um, so what do we do? What are we thinking now with IT, uh, with, with where things are, with the crisis that's going on? Uh, you know, the thing to keep in mind is that with any crisis or emergency, it's really important to stop uh, think and, and then act. Uh, you don't want to just act on instinct. Um, you know, not to make light of, of, of a pandemic and a crisis, but uh, you know, there's a run on toilet paper, and, and it doesn't really make sense. It's people who are uh, really just acting without really thinking about the need uh, for all of that toilet paper. Um, and so, uh, what we have is right now we have companies that are reacting to crisis uh, in, a, in a similar manner. They're not thoroughly thinking through uh, the changes that they are making in order to adapt. Um, things that we are seeing uh, quite often, mistakes that are being made, we see a lot of hastily planned system upgrades. Um, you know, you know there, there's the, well, we need everybody to be able to work remotely, so we need to upgrade our firewall to allow that additional capacity. And people are rushing these firewall upgrades or these server upgrades, uh, and that's causing these firewalls and servers to be in, improperly configured. Um, and, and improperly configured firewalls means security vulnerabilities. 
So we're seeing a, num a, a, a good amount of that. Uh, we're seeing people providing remote access without putting the proper security pro precautions in place. Uh, they're, they're just uh, enabling remote access for anybody and everybody without, without thinking about what it means to do that, without making sure the people getting that remote access really need it to do, do, their, to do their job. We're seeing people broadly open, opening up systems to remote access. So basically anybody can get in. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really scary there. Um, we're seeing people have employees use their personal computers at home to access these remote systems. So they're opening up the, the internal corporate IT to people and their home computers with all the uncontrolled uh, uh, security vulnerabilities that may be there on those home computers. Uh, and, and we're also seeing people not ensuring that the newly deployed systems, newly needed systems can support all this increased workload and that can cause problems there. Uh, so, so as we go through this crisis and people are making changes uh, and doing and making uh, adopting new protocols from, from a IT security perspective, uh, we really want to make sure they're thinking through the proposed changes, uh, making sure that the changes are needed, making sure that uh, they're being done in a metered and discrete fashion. Uh, so making discrete changes one at a time uh, monitoring your results, uh, being ready to roll back changes if they cause a problem. Um, you know, we want to make sure people are reviewing the cybersecurity and the policy implications and making sure the changes are, are needed, right, and, and that they're the correct changes. Um, and we want to make sure uh, that uh, people are placing the proper focus on the site uh, 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 of their site uh, cybersecurity functions and making sure they're looking at the right, making sure they're looking. Uh, so when you make a change to a firewall, are you looking at your firewall logs to make sure that the firewall is behaving properly and that it's blocking things you, you think it's blocking and, and, and letting things that you want to let through. Uh, so, you know, monitoring systems that may be in place, uh, make sure that the new device and new firewall is being added to the monitoring system so that people are paying attention to it. Uh, those are all the things that, you know, at a high level, uh, we want to make sure that people are doing. Uh, and with that, I want to hand it over to uh, Jeff Simplo here with uh, some uh, cybersecurity best practices to give you some specific tips. Thank you, David. Um, clearly, we're all, for the most part, telecommuting uh, at this point in time. And, and I thought it would be prudent to talk about um, safety tips about how we're commuting. Um, through our home offices, how we're reaching out to people, um, how we're sharing data, and and equally important, what kind of uh, what devices are we using to do all of that? Um, talk a little bit more about phishing and uh, zooming um, because that seems to be a new protocol that um, many people uh, are using and taking advantage of, but I think need to do so in a uh, safe manner. So moving on to our new office, um, clearly, uh, by the way, this is not my office. It's um, uh, too clean at this point anyway, with lots of wires. But, um, you know, one of the things we need to be thinking about is, you know, should we be using our own home computers um, to access uh, the company network and access uh, um, uh, other uh, sites? And, you know, from a best practices perspective, um, I would certainly highly recommend that um, people only use their company approved devices. And there are really a couple reasons for that. One is hopefully, you know, your company has put into place good antivirus software, updated antivirus software uh, on your uh, uh, approved device. Um, that um, it's secure and it's put into practice. Um, remote access software is on there. And, and I, I certainly try to tell people, don't use your, uh, your home device because there's a lot of unknowns with the home device that um, uh, people uh, just really, they just don't know. Um, the other piece is, try not to let your family members use your work uh, computer or other type of work devices. And I say that in, in a very loving way because certainly we wanna help our family member, 
our family members, you know, during this time of crisis. But um, we as individuals hopefully have been trained by uh, our, our company to, you know, to know the do's and the don'ts of re going out on the internet and accessing websites or responding to emails. Um, sometimes our family members aren't as well uh, trained and it, it probably makes sense for um, us to maintain some type of security on our respective company devices. And, and for those reasons, I would certainly um, do your best not to let family members, you know, use your work computer or other types of devices. Regarding your home network, um, I would imagine all of us who are telecommuting are using our home network. Um, many times, uh, you know, we get our home network in place and, you know, we haven't been in this situation before where we're actually using it quite a bit to do, you know, regular work. And, and as it relates to that, just make sure to the best of your ability that um, your home uh, network is password protected and encrypted uh, wherever possible. Um, one of the other things I would absolutely recommend is to just make sure that the default user ID and password that came with um, your your home Wi-Fi network has been changed. Um, a lot of times, you know, you'll, you'll get that uh, uh, home network in place and you, you forget to change the whatever the standard uh, user ID and default passwords were. Um, that certainly does need to be changed so that uh, other people can't take advantage of it. Um, using VPN and, and um, MFA, multi-factor authentication. So I, I would certainly share with everyone that whenever you're connecting to either your company's network or any other network that you can implement VPN, which stands for Virtual Private Network, that's really an ideal time to take advantage of, of best practices and, and better security. Um, Multi-factor authentication is yet another standard that whenever and wherever you can use multi-factor um, is extremely important because at the end of the day, these are um, good um, business practice tools to put in place and whenever and wherever possible, please do take advantage of the, the virtual private network VPN um, and multi-factor authentication uh, whenever possible. And although it sounds kind of funny, but do lock your computer um, or other device when not in use, um, particularly if you're outside of your home and you're, you're um, uh, taking advantage of even a cell phone, just make sure to lock it when, it, when it's not in use because um, you know people are looking um, to um, uh, find these devices and uh, take advantage of all of us. Moving on to the next slide, um, you know, we need to look at and protect our company data. Um, I would venture to say that most of us never had a telecommuting uh, IT policy in place prior to the COVID-19 um, uh, situation that we're in right now. Some did, but I would say most didn't. Um, and as part of that telecommuting um, policy, it, it would have or should have talked about protecting the company data and identifying where that company data lives. Um, and equally important, not copying or sending confidenti confidential data um, to personal email accounts. That's a big no-no. Um, we shouldn't be sending any type of confidential uh, data through email accounts. Um, it just opens up the door. Um, once, it, once an email leaves your, um, your computer, we don't really know where it goes, meaning we don't know who can access it. Um, there are times where emails might be forwarded inadvertently. I've seen that happen before. Um, so do our best not to send um, confidential data through our personal email accounts. Um, I would also recommend, you know, not sharing or not copying any of that confidential data to your personal computer. Um, it just is a duplicate copy, and and again, we don't know where or how it can get out of your 
your personal computer. I would say, though, that we should use and share what our company has identified as a way to um, uh, share data um, through different tools um, that have provision that have been provisioned by the company um, like ShareFile or like Teams, even Dropbox. But again, these devices have been put in place because um, they're secure and they're ways for us to share information, company information in a in a secure way. I guess at the worst, if you did need to share com confidential data um, through email, make sure that it is encrypted and do your best to encrypt your data whenever and wherever possible. Phishing um, has become um, worse and worse during during this COVID crisis and, and you know, I, I personally am just seeing a significant increase in the amount of phishing activities um, that are taking place now and and part of it is due um, because there's increased tension and the hackers um, and attackers realize that um, with increased tension people are um, uh, have this anxiety to be quite frank and they are going to they're going to prey on that so just be careful of it i think david mentioned before stop think and then react or stop, think, and then click. So when you see a, a phishing email, just stop and review it and process it. Make sure that you know it makes sense and then process it accordingly. Um, I, I don't trust any emails that are requesting information and I don't care who it's coming from. Um, and then I'm gonna tell you right now, never provide a username or password to anyone. One of the, um, I, I think one of the phishing attacks that we're starting to see and, and I predict will get worse and worse is, you know, um, a trusted IT person reaching out to you from your company asking you for your company uh, user ID and password for some reason. Um, there's no reason to give it out. If they need to change um, your password, they can do so on the back end. They never need to know what your password is. So please be careful as it relates to um, phishing. And then lastly, um, I just wanted to go to, to Zoom and Zooming safely. Zooming, um, and Zooming technology or Zoom uh, website has become a, a platform for many organizations to provide a platform where we can um, have meetings and conference calls and do it through, you know, um, video and and um, uh, a regular voice, and you know there are certain safety features that people should be uh, implementing as it relates to uh, using and using or taking advantage of Zoom. Um, we've heard this concept of Zoom bombing. Um, I, I submit that it's probably because there's a number of items in the security uh, and safety features within Zoom that were not uh, appropriately configured, typically by the meeting host. So, you know, here's a list of things that you may want to consider um, that are config that are configurable in a Zoom meeting, um, requiring encryption. Uh, disabling file transfers, um, actually securing login um, and, and setting up um, meetings with passwords. Um, so you need to have a password in, in order to send or to start um, an actual meeting. Um, require a password for participants to, to join into the Zoom meeting. Um, these are all things that can be set by the meeting host and I strongly encourage any meeting host to go out there and, and take a look at these settings and um, put them in place um, as you see fit for your Zoom meeting, including enable a waiting room because what you can do is you can see actually who's coming in to your Zoom meeting and making sure that you're not getting a uh, Zoom bomb, so to speak, and, and making sure that you're creating a secure environment 
um, for your telecommuting uh, uh, environment within within Zoom. So I think with that, Heather, I share, uh, turn it over to you. Absolutely, thank you, Jeff. Um, just to follow up on that, I'm sure you all have seen all over the news that the, the FBI warnings with Zoom and that the New York City School District has now banned Zoom. Um, I think it's a knee-jerk reaction to what David was saying, how people are you know, rushing to make sure that their organization can continue business operations keep things running smoothly and security is sometimes a second thought for them. You know, it has to be on the front end of everybody's mind. Um, you know, two minutes before my kids had their online learning, we get those passwords that Jeff was just referring to. Again, you know, that's just one avenue. That's one social media area. And this is obviously a very small snapshot what you're seeing on your screen right now as far as what's out there from a social network. Um, you know, I had my my daughter in school, they had a practice where they did for two months, they sent out, write, they had to write letters to either classmates, you could send them in, those sorts of things. And when I was explaining it to her, she's like, mom, why are we not just sending an email? How would you take the time and write all that out? So, you know, the world is completely changing. There's so much access to our children. They keep getting um, messaging requests and so do all of us, right? So now that we feel we don't have that physical interaction with people, we're looking for it from a social standpoint of some sort in our new social distancing world. And it's via these chat rooms, anything social media. Um, the thing is, we don't know who we're talking to all the time. We don't know who else are in these meetings. Um, we don't know as far as, you know, to Jeff and David's points about the, the phishing, um, people are looking for information out there about you. They're looking to take advantage of you. You know, people are very scared about what's going on because we are absolutely obviously in a crisis and you know people will do anything to get through it um make sure that their families are safe and that they're the number one also with this you're looking at such things you know there's a rise i think jeff had mentioned emails and i believe david did as well but think about just text messaging i have gotten so many text messages for you know online retailers or i mean retailers in general because they're getting hit so hard about deep discounts um, from restaurants promoting, you know, a discount on gift certificates or those sorts of things, you know, click this link, you'll receive 50% off or you receive this, that, or the other thing, you know, you need to make sure that those emails and those text messages are getting cleared off your phone. So, you know, through, and you're just hitting, you know, highlighting it in the more button and deleting it out or swiping and deleting those messages. You know, Jeff had mentioned making sure you're locking your devices. You're at home, your kid picks up your phone, they hit the link by accident, you know, something of that nature. It really, you know, it really is very extremely crucial to make sure that you are taking proactive steps to make sure that you're secure and you're safe on that. Um, you know, it's it's coming in from all different directions. Like we mentioned, it's the phishing, or it's the emails, it's the text messages, it's phone calls. Um, you know, obviously with the tax delay, there's gonna be a lot through the IRS and some people already have filed their taxes and, and that sort of thing. You know, you really need to make sure that we're being proactive, we're being safe, and we're being smart about what we're doing. So if you're asked to join a chat room or you're looking up information as far as a special interest group or something of that nature, because networking now obviously is taking a completely different turn and we'll, we'll come back to that. But being safe um, and knowing what you're actually putting out there about yourself. So just to, on the next slide is just showing you um, a little bit of what Jeff was referring to in his last comments as far as the Zoom meeting was concerned. This was actually a birthday meeting that was taking place because this is how we celebrate birthdays now. Um, you know, there's a couple of things going on. Obviously, the meeting actually was hijacked by the younger brother and trying to, you know, disrupt it so that it wasn't all about his sister and her birthday. So it was very frustrating trying to get content across and getting communications. The bottom thing is if you have a meeting like this and you see at the bottom of it where it says Grammy and JB, well, who are they actually? And you can change your name to be whatever you want. You know, so we take this a little bit a step further. Think about the online learning that's going on, the virtual happy hours that are occurring. Um, you know, you, I'm sure we're all part of networking groups where there's probably, you know, at least 20, if not more people that are dialing into the call. It's very easy for people to say, you know, that they don't actually share their video themselves, that they, you know, so we don't know who they are you know they could just understand get the name of somebody in that group change their name to enter the meeting 
and then be a part of that meeting. You know, what we're seeing is that, and what I see, I expect to see more of is that hijacking via Zoom or any of the other social media um, te uh, templates is that people will take information that they obtain in that in, in that meeting and potentially use it against them. You know, so you think about, you know, uh, kids in college or potentially even high school where their teacher's trying to teach them online and they either post something in the middle of the meeting that's inappropriate and screenshot it or record the meeting and then say, you know what, they failed me and look at what they're doing and look at what they're teaching um, in these meetings. Think about the happy hours. You know, we let loose a little bit more that, you know, we're sharing some information and funny stories during this crisis of times. But if you're in there with coworkers or other people that you're potentially, you know, going against to keep your job, there are going to be people that are going to be potentially using that information to, to blackmail and, you know, protect themselves. Because again, it's in times of dire crisis, it's kind of a number one and their families that they're trying to protect. So, you know, we have to be vigilant. We have to be smart. We have to use all the techniques that we've been talking about throughout this webinar so far and really be sure of the content that we're providing and knowing, you know, exactly what we're saying, what we're, what we're doing. Um, they're sharing a lot of screens, right? So, People are putting up inappropriate content by sharing their screen, hijacking meetings, changing the name, the virtual backgrounds. All of these things are just ways of potentially putting yourself in a vulnerable state. So we do need to think about what's going on in all of these meetings. All right. So if avoiding it, you just don't put something online to be known if you if you don't want it to be known. Um, you know, I, I say this every time I speak is Google yourself. Find out what's out there about you. Find out what pictures you've posted of yourself or others have posted of you. Find out if you know your agenda is known, if you're on boards or things of that nature. If you don't understand all the information that's out there about yourself, you're more susceptible to falling victim to some type of phishing attack or social media attack or potential blackmail. Um, I think you know. I do think it's going to be the new type of ransomware. We could just go back. That'd be great. Thank you. Um, but knowing, you know, if you're putting up, a lot of people, you know, are sitting at home. So they are doing either online shopping or things of that nature. And if they're not going out or posting pictures of them trapped in their house, as far as things, you got to think about what's in the background. You know, if there are valuables, if there are things that people could use against you or things of that nature, um, you know, everyone is at home. They're, they don't have as busy schedules anymore. They're obviously doing remote working for those people that can. But again, you know, people are in desperate times and have desperate measures. You know, again, the economy is just, we don't know where, where it's going um, and people are really struggling with it. We're obviously getting stimulus packages out there and things of that nature, but, you know, we don't understand everybody else's situation. So you need to be really, really conscious of, of especially now of everything that you're putting out there about yourself. Okay. Um, and ensure that, you know, every time David had spoken about doing upgrades and updates and things of that nature, it doesn't just apply to your work environment and your servers and, and those sorts of things. It actually, it, you really need to understand as far as when you install app updates on your phone and any other devices, your iPads or any other devices that you have, if it's resetting some of those security settings, you need to go in and make sure that you're checking your security and your privacy on any of the apps that you have updated. Um, ensure that you know who you're speaking with again. You know, it, it really makes sure that it's very legitimate people that you know, because again, in these times of crisis, you can't put too much past anybody. And again, you know, text messages, emails, phone calls, anything of that nature. If you even have the slightest doubt about it, delete it. If it's a legitimate email, it's going to come again, or you're going to get it notified in some other fashion. For phone call scams, ask if they can get a number and call them back. You can put the number into Google, find out if it's legitimate, find out, or just even do a quick Google search and say, what are the types of scams going out there? Is there, you know, a vacation scam going on by Marriott? Is there a credit card scam going on by, you know, you name it. Google is a very powerful tool and the more you utilize it, you know, someone else has Googled it before you. So they're, you know, 99 times out of 100, if not more there's going to be some sort of information if you're just proactive about it that you can really protect yourself about. And with that, I think I will hand it over to Frank Rudetz. Thanks, Heather. Uh, I'm going to talk about, and we've covered some of them, 
uh, already, but I'm going to talk about some of the uh, more common uh, scams that are ongoing now, um, which really aren't any different from what uh, is happening um, all the time. It's just now it's more prevalent. We have something that they're keying in on, uh, and the scammers have something else right now um, that provides them more leverage, and that's our emotions. This is, is a very emotional time. We have a, a virus that is affecting uh, many people, loved ones, and they are playing on our emotions to get some quick responses and uh, responses that are not really thinking about. So what are some of these right now? As you can see on the screen, uh, undelivered goods. Um, one thing that we all have uh, someone that we know on social media that seems to have the latest headlines, latest news, and posts it immediately. Well, the people that know um, the news headlines better than anybody else are the scammers. They follow them. They know what's a hot topic. They know what's in demand. They know what people are um, looking for. So these undelivered goods tend to be things that are uh, in, in demand, whether that's toilet paper, hand sanitizer, um, uh, test kits, things like that, that they will be emailing out and sending um, uh, links for you to um, provide money. Sometimes they even say they're free. Uh, obtain a free test kit at home. Um, what they would ask for uh, is your credit card information uh, solely for shipping, uh, and then you don't get the goods. Uh, or you will order the goods, and uh, they never come. The fake charities, again, playing on our emotions. Um, there are many people in need right now. We all want to do our part. And uh, there will be links to donations to get this uh, going um, now. And uh, these events are what uh, draws you in. Uh, the fake emails and texts. Um, the uh, Emails, again, looking for, all of these are looking for your information. Um, uh, sole, their sole objective is to uh, gain your financial information, your personal information that's going to give them some other advantage. And I think I, just real quickly, as I'm talking about this, I just want to reiterate um, what uh, Dave, Jeff, and, and Heather have talked about, but some of the Carmen uh, jargon of you know, how they're doing this. So there's what we call a social engineering attack. Um, that's usually verbal. That's them calling and talking to you and trying to gain uh, information about your company, your individual, other individuals by sounding uh, that they're legitimate or sounding like they are close friends, close colleagues uh, and partners. Again, asking for information that they could link together and piece together either solely from you or from a, a host of people so that they give, gives them private information. A phishing attack is fairly common. Uh, this is typically through emails, um, getting you to um, uh, click on links um, and provide other information. Um, there is a, a vishing attack. Uh, that is uh, typically through um, voicemail, um, voice communications. Uh, it may look uh, like a call coming from a legitimate source, uh, but uh, what they've done is it's a fake number that's coming through, and it, again, trying to gain um, the, the information through that, through what you uh, misplaced trust. Uh, and then lastly, um, the smishing attack. That is through text, um, SMS, text messages, and, and the like, where typically there will be a link um, embedded in that text or within that text asking you to click on it and it's um, identical to uh, the phishing attack. Now these emails are going to ask for different things. It may ask you to, uh, if you click now within the next 10 minutes, uh, you are eligible for a free home testing kit or some other supply. Or um, now, uh, play, again, playing on emotion, especially with the distance that we have, uh, grandparents and the elderly are um, uh, high, uh, big targets. Some of the grandparent scams are, are typically from a grandchild, uh, a friend of a grandchild, saying that they're in the hospital, they need money 
to pay for a certain uh, treatment, they don't have anything, they can't reach their parents, or they're in a, uh, another country. Uh, this is not something new. These scams have been around, but again, because of the health um, uh, scare, uh, the, uh, our emotions um, draw it to the, the forefront. Uh, robocalls, we know what they are. Um, you're going to get more and more of those now. Um, these robocalls, again, are going to be asking you to uh, provide information that you normally wouldn't provide. And last uh, on our slide here is misinformation. You see this on social media. You see um, you might get text about this, emails about this, and it is geared towards telling you something that is going to make you um, uh, afraid, make you more um, concerned. Uh, an example being um, uh, there's going to be a shortage of a certain product in the next week. Uh, it might be a headline. It might be fake, uh, you know, a whole article drawn up. Uh, and then right after that or within that, you're going to get a link or some type of communication saying, if you would like to get uh, be first on the list, uh, we can have these things delivered to your house within uh, seven days. Uh, next slide. So what do we do? Um, I think David mentioned it, we've all been reiterating around it, is think. I like to say we need to walk before we run. There is no urgency here. You are not going to be the first one to receive your stimulus check if you click on this link. Um, remember the words no and no. Uh, know your scammer. In this uh, age of social distancing, uh, we're all practicing it very, very well. Uh, we need to do the opposite, uh, virtual closeness, virtual connecting. If you're getting an unsolicited email or an email asking about things, then let's find out about them. Let's consider this our second date. The first date went okay. You didn't really know anything about the other party. Now it's the second date. We really want to know who this is, what they're from, what they're about. There's plenty of information at our fingertips. Uh, as far as scams go, the FTC and other government sites are a wealth of knowledge. FTC.gov has the latest scams uh, related to the coronavirus. Uh, there are uh, the FBI, local police department uh, websites. Uh, Better Business Bureau uh, will have, as far as uh, to look up, and we're all at home, uh, it's at our fingertips. Uh, there is a website called uh, The Ripoff Report. It's been around for a while. Uh, it deals solely with uh, fraud uh, and complaints. You can search by company name. You can search by dates. I checked this morning. Uh, it's been updated as of this morning. So continually people around the world are putting things on um, the website uh, complaining about fraud uh, and, then, and, and that. Um, check phone numbers. Um, to find out, and, and again, uh, Google, Bing, any other search engine uh, you can plug in through there, as well as our government um, sites. Next, next um, slide. And besides knowing our customer, remember how to say no. No is a complete sentence. Um, it's no period. It's not no comma. Uh, when you're not uh, comfortable with something, um, we say no and we hang up. Uh, think about your animals. When you're trying to teach uh, a pet, a dog, not to do something, you don't rationalize. You don't say, no, Ginger, you cannot jump on the couch because that's going to ruin our leather and that might stain and I might have to buy another couch. You say no. That's what we need to do uh, in this context. We don't engage in banter. These people are professionals. Uh, as uh, we've said, uh, the other people working at home are the fraudsters, are the scammers. They do it 24-7, 365 days a year. Uh, they are very good at uh, extracting information for the people that allow them to. And lastly, disengage. The hang-up works very good uh, on robocalls, on emails, um, uh, not, uh, not responding. And lastly, I'll wrap this my part up with just a couple of other tips on what to do now to not only um, uh, prevent 
um, but to uh, prohibit. Uh, we're getting more and more emails now, uh, many of which are unsolicited, many of which are, um, you know, not malicious emails. They might be government emails, news emails, but now's the time to unsubscribe to any unsolicited email. We don't need them. You've got other things to do. You got, I'm sure we get plenty of emails from work in that. Now's the time to unsubscribe to those unsolicited ones. Uh, get on the do not call list. Um, for uh, any of these numbers. When you're getting robocalls, click on the one, um, find out how to get on the do not call list uh, and use it. You can block unwanted callers. Uh, when you see this number come up, block it. Um, on any of your websites, when they are asking for uh, multi-factor auth authentications, um, use it. Uh, this uh, helps prevent your um, email and um, login information being stolen because there's a second factor coming through. And then lastly, um, I think, again, just to reiterate, uh, confirm on your equipment, that is everything is up to date and installed and your antivirus and anti-malware um, uh, softwares all have the appropriate updates. Thank you, Frank. Um, I thought it would be great to to answer some questions that came in um, to us already. Um, first question, and David Sun, I think this would be a good one for you. Should a company consider purchasing cybersecurity insurance, and if so, why? Um, I would say most definitely. Uh, yeah, if you're in business these days, you should be looking at cybersecurity insurance. Um, it is designed to cover a, a variety of, well, well, first it's one of a few different plans you might have as a business. Uh, you might have general liability, errors and omissions, and things like that. Um, and, and this is just one other component uh, to that to, to help make sure you're being covered. Um, you know, cyber, secure, cyber security insurance can cover a number of things. It's not just, oh, somebody stole some data from me, and so what's the value of that data? Uh, it's it's it can help you cover uh, well you know somebody stole the data from me and now I need to uh, do a forensic investigation to see what was stolen and, and, and what was done with that stolen data uh, I need to cover the cost of well that stolen data was used to compromise one of my clients I mean that's really the scariest thing uh, is uh, as 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 a business many of us will hold sensitive documents for our clients uh, and the damage, uh, if somebody attacks us and takes that time, uh, that sensitive data for our client, the damage that can be done to the client with that sensitive information, um, <clears throat> the risk and liability associated with that to my business, that, that's, that, that's very scary because that is an uh, immeasurable uh, uh, number from my perspective or, or from, our, you know, from, the, the, from our perspective. Um, and so uh, that's the kind of thing cybersecurity assurance is designed to do. Uh, to cover, uh, you know, ransomware, it can, it might pay the ransom. Uh, so it's just a number of things you need to look at. Uh, however, what I tell everybody is, yes, you want to have cyber insurance, but you need to make sure it's the right cyber insurance policy. Uh, cyber insurance is very, very new, and so uh, every policy out there is different from another. It's not like car insurance or or homeowners insurance where you know, they're all pretty similar. Uh, their cyber insurance is dramatically different. What it covers, what the uh, what the preconditions are for coverage. Coverage, uh, you know, does does the policy cover pre-existing conditions, pre-existing vulnerabilities in the system? We've seen situations where uh, companies have purchased policies that that will not cover a pre-existing vulnerability. So that means if there is a a patch, there's a computer in your network that doesn't have the Windows patch, uh, all the Windows patches, and one of the ones that's missing is the cause of the vulnerability or the, or the compromise, you know, years from now, uh, that the policy won't cover that loss. So you need to make sure you understand what you're buying and read it through uh, because they are all very different. But again, you should be looking at cyber insurance, most definitely. Sounds good. Um, there have been a number of questions uh, on VPN. Uh, virtual private network. 
In fact, someone um, said, please address VPN, whatever that is, and whether that should be used. Is VPN safe? Um, and, and I don't know, Heather, any thoughts on that? Yep, <laughs> definitely a lot of thoughts. I think, you know, we did touch on a little bit throughout the presentation, both, I think David and Jeff, you, you both did, but, you know, it is something that you absolutely want to be using. It allows you to act like you are sitting in your office. So you're in that private network of your organization, um, you know, and it shares information across the private network to a public network, but with ensuring that data is, is still secured and safe. Um, it allows you to access resources that, you know, maybe only on your certain work computers and things of that nature. Um, so at any times, yes, it, you know, it, it provides an extra additional level of security. So you want to make sure that you're using strong passwords with it as well, right? So obviously usernames are really easy to guess, but you want to make sure that your passwords are really strong. Um, you don't want to make sure, you want to make sure you're protecting that information. So it is another way that we are setting up the virtual and organizational environment and ensuring that our networks are safe and strong. Um, you know, you don't want to be downloading anything. Obviously, Jeff had mentioned to, you know, your personal computers or your personal email or things of that nature. Even if you are connected to VPN and you send it to one of those places, you know, you're out, you're outside of that network. So you, you do want to make sure that you're utilizing it. Um, you want to make sure that you have strong credentialing as you go through and you want to make sure that your organization has, has set it up in a secure manner as well. And that they're updating. Now, one thing one thing I would add to what Heather is saying is uh, what's what's important to differentiate here is uh, you know Heather and, and us we are talking about the VPN that your company has provided you to use. That's the VPN you most definitely want to use, and will provide you all the protections that we're we're talking about. However, you know keep in mind there are a number of there there's a lot of VPN services out there. Um, you know, ones like IPVanish.com or CyberGhost or Private Internet Access or Nord. Uh, those are not corporate VPNs. Those are not ones your company is running most of the time, most likely. And those are designed uh, for, for a, from a privacy perspective in terms of so that your internet service provider and, you know, the FBI or NSA or whoever might be watching doesn't see what websites you're going to. But that is not the kind of VPN that we're talking about that is going to be useful to protect your corporate security. So we want to make sure that people understand the, different, the difference between them and not get confused. So a uh, question, David, that came up is if I use a Mac, um, do I need to use a VPN? Do I also need to worry about antivirus? Uh, you know, the answer is yes. A, a Mac is, 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 is Max while they they tend to have fewer vulnerabilities and tend to be a little bit less susceptible to viruses and things like that. They are not immune. There are plenty of Mac viruses and Mac uh, hacks and vulnerabilities out there. So, you know, all the things we talk about for cybersecurity apply whether you're using a Mac, a Windows, a Linux, Unix, whatever computer you're using, it doesn't matter. Um, they all apply. So is a VPN going to slow down my, my wireless access at all? Probably not to a degree that you're going to notice. Okay. Um, there's a question uh, that just came in. We recently upgraded to Office 365 and have been relying on OneDrive. Do you have any helpful tips on using a cloud-based file system? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, Office 365 is, is a perfectly fine product. Uh, we work with, we use that for a lot of our clients. We help a lot of clients deploy that and manage that. However, it needs to be done properly. Um, so, I, I, you know, uh, like I just said, we, we recommend and uh, we, we do deploy a lot of Microsoft Office 365 at our client's request. Uh, however, I also say that Microsoft Office 365 is probably the most compromised cloud service provider out there. Uh, wow, that sounds like like a little bit of a of a of a of a contradiction. Why we why would we work with that? Well, you know, it actually can be pretty safe. It actually can be uh, uh, very safe if you deploy it properly. The problem, however, is that by default it is not deployed safe, and it takes time, energy, and effort to really configure it properly to be safe. Uh, I think the single most important thing that people should do when they're using Office 365 is to deploy, Jeff, as you discussed, uh, multi-factor authentication, MFA, 
You got to do that if you're using Office 365 or any other cloud provider that, that allows it. Uh, otherwise, you are going to, uh, you, you are very likely going to have a problem down the road. David, I'd also suggest if you're using Office 365 that there's a, a feature to turn off forwarding of emails. And I, I think both you and I would agree and, and everyone else on this call that um, forwarding has been a uh, an issue where um, if someone is able to hack into someone's account, they'll start forwarding all the emails to them. And now they know everything that's going on with that particular user. And um, by turning off forwarding, uh, if at all possible, it'll, it'll help protect uh, your account that much more. But I yeah. agree, multi-factor, yeah. absolutely. And then another tidbit, you know, for people is is uh, if it's appropriate, disable uh, logs login from uh, outside the U.S. You know, it does is is some. Do you have somebody in North Korea really legitimately logging into your corporate network? I mean, you probably don't have any employees there, right? So disabling logins from you know outside the U.S. or certain parts of the country is is another thing you can do uh, with Office 365 and other cloud-based systems. Um, a question we did also get is, what security tips um, would you have for uh, online banking and, and doing online banking safely um, with any of the brokerage sites or like a Fidelity or any other type of financial institution? Any thoughts on that? Uh, I, I have some thoughts, but you know, Heather, I, I, not to put you on the spot, you know, but you're the you definitely have all the banking, you know, you have a lot of banking expertise. Maybe if you want to share some of that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Sorry. Um, I think you know, just jumping in quickly, the, the main things with anything as far as online banking is concerned is you know, banks are probably one of the most popular emails that gets sent from a phishing perspective, right? So you want to make sure that it actually you're hovering over that link, making sure it's from a trusted source. Um, you know, password security is extremely important in these situations. So if you have everything coming to like your email, your personal email account, you need to make sure, you know, that if I'm scared about anything, it's about my email being hacked because then they know all my buying preferences, they know my banking, they know stuff about my kids' information, all of this, that sort of thing. So, you know, it, it has to be strong, it has to be secure, you have to be aware, you have to be proactive as well in monitoring your accounts. You know, a lot of us kind of just fall into the groove of saying, okay, well, that's why I have the bank, is that they're doing, and, you know, they're making sure all my transactions are accurate, making sure that, you know, they're the one managing my money. Same with, you know, other financial institutions and brokerages. You you do have to be proactive, you know, in, in times like these, that's the number one defense along with your password. So, you know, again, be aware, be cautious, you know, ask questions, don't always trust what's going on. But, you know, those are the types of things. And again, like your security questions, if your banks are still using security questions to change your password, make sure they're not information that you have out there about yourself on social media. You know, make sure it's not the name of your college mascot because, you know, your college is probably out there on LinkedIn or, you know, your mother's your name because you might be connected to her on Facebook or, you know, some of those questions that people can really figure out. Um, you need to make sure that there's something, you know, very consistent. So a lot of times I tell people, um, you know, if it's mother's maiden name, you say Boston Red Sox. If it's, you know, name of the street you grew up on, Boston Red Sox, you know, your favorite food, Boston Red Sox, you know, things that don't make sense or are not easily guessable. Um, but something that you'll remember. Um, it is very important because, again, the type of online fraud protection, especially with the economy is right now, um, could we could see a, a huge change in, in you know current practices. But that's the number one thing. People are worried about their jobs. They're worried about their economy, taking care of their families. So you, you have to be cautious. You have to be proactive. Um, and you have to take a, your level of security and awareness up a few notches. And Heather, I would add, um, if and if your financial institution, online banking, Fidelity, whomever, offers multi-factor authentication, two-factor authentication is the same thing, implement it. it. It can't hurt. It adds an extra step, and it will certainly protect you um, significantly. Um, we're going to add, end up with one last question, uh, and, and Frank, I'm going to ask you this. Um, our organization has moved 95%, I'm reading someone else's question, by the way, has moved 90% of our staff offsite. It was done in about four days. Um, what are you seeing, Frank, as the 
methods that bad actors are using to create, induce, or penetrate a system uh, via a restricted user? What, what's the most, what, what are you seeing today? Um, as far as security issues by working at home? I'm not yeah. understanding. Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, what, well, as far as, yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, so the thing to remember and what we're advising people is you are now working in a place for most people that you haven't worked uh, ever for some. You're going from a secure uh, office um, platform and site to a new place. So consider it as if you're starting a new job. You're starting a new job where you, um, you're walking into an, another place and you have individuals that don't aren't necessarily um, authorized to see what you have. So think of your home office in that same regard. You're going to protect uh, confidential information and documents from being seen on screen. You're going to protect it, um, your computer and your laptop from other family members from using it. You're going to um, keep your other um, work-related items um, separate from the other spots. And we get we tend to get a little bit more complacent or a little bit more relaxed when we're in our home office. Uh, and that's where uh, these scammers can exploit um, the, your, your online vulnerabilities. I want to uh, mention, because I did see one of the questions about, um, and I think we addressed it, but uh, elder abuse um, and the exploitation of the elderly. Um, keep this in mind that yes, they are vulnerable for some people because of cognitive um, issues, but also think of it the other way. Uh, a certain segment of the population has already been distanced a little bit socially, so they're always looking for connections. And the more you've worked uh, throughout your life in the elderly, oftentimes you're, you're more financially stable. You do have the wherewithal to help other people. This is where now, because of the exploitation of the emotions, they want to help and they think they need to um, uh, get it done through this uh, uh, website or uh, immediately. So remember this, um, whether it's you need the money because of the stimulus check or others, um, there's nothing you have to do. Uh, all of the guidance isn't out yet, but the government uh, is not requiring you, uh, as of right now, to do anything. The check will be mailed to you. Uh, you are not going to get it uh, quicker than anybody else by signing up with some type of service. Uh, and then secondly, it always sounds a little cool, but I strongly recommend it. Um, become your own private investigator. You get an email, you want to help, then check it out a bit. You, there's plenty of resources to go through. Look through these things and find out uh, if what they're saying is true with the caveat that oftentimes the lack of information about a company might be a worse red, red flag um, than uh, negative information. And with that, I'll close. Thank you, Frank, very much. Uh, and with that, um, we've ended our hour long session today. Um, thank you, David. Uh, Heather and Frank for your your very concise and very good information. Um, for those of you who are still left online, um, we will be providing the slides and the webinar on the Bloom Shapiro website. Thank you very much. Um, please stay safe and healthy over these next number of weeks as we all are dealing with um, the COVID crisis. Thank you again. Bye-bye.